uh, introduction. Sean Armstrong is the leading electrification expert in North America and has co-authored five user-friendly guides to building electrification. His firm, Redwood Energy, has led the nation in residential ZNE design. Um, would love uh, some uh, details behind those letters, Sean. Uh, since 2011, 2,500 plus all electric, 100% solar powered homes. Among other noteworthy awards, Redwood Energy has won the grand prize World Habitat Award from the United Nations in 2017 for a farm worker family development that used an all electric design and 100% solar power to close the funding gap that prevented construction. When I reached out to Sean um, to see uh, if he was available to work with our youth led mobilizing team during our 46 days of action, I think I got you know, halfway into my pitch, all I said was electrification, induction stovetops, and Sean just cut me off and said, yeah, I'm in. Um, so without further ado, we'll get to our speaker tonight. Um, warm welcome for Sean. Hey, the crowd goes wild. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so um, thanks so much for having me. I totally appreciate your time this evening. You're welcome to interrupt. Like, take yourself off mute if you got a question while I'm presenting. Uh, my, my first career is as a science teacher, and it's you know against the rules to talk for 50 minutes and not take questions. And so I really don't want to have that feeling that I'm just abusing you by talking on and talking on. This is for you. So please you know, use me that way. It's like, oh, he's here to be a resource, not just a talker. Ask your questions. And you can put them in the, the chat as well. And, and Nick, you might want to, you'll monitor that, I know. Um, but please do interrupt me as appropriate. OK, and don't interrupt. Ask questions, I mean to say. Residential Electrification 101, uh, in pursuit of a just, cleaner, quieter, less expensive, safer lifestyle. Uh, those are all good words to use as you organize around electrification, which is written into the Green New Deal. That is also the clean energy plan that Biden has proposed. You know, not the Green New Deal, but you know, the Green New Deal. <laughs> um, so I got the quick intro. Um, for those of you who lived through the Carter era, I was born in 76, and you might remember that there were hundreds of demonstration houses built around the country, like this one, which is where I was trained. All of them were canceled in 1980, except this one by Reagan. He came in and canceled the um, Office of Appropriate Technology, which had set up demonstration homes and tons of flyers and every, you know, hamlet, you know, center of habitation, like, you know, little cities and such would have at least one where you could go and learn about greenhouses that help to keep your house warm or insulated curtains or just insulation. Always an electrification stop the fossil fuels uh, program. So that was my, I've been trained there forever. I should have updated this to 2021. <laughs> I continue to be involved. Uh, then as a high school teacher I mentioned, um, I focused specifically on anti-racism. And so briefly, you should know that since 2004, we now understand tanning. I think we started teaching in 2004, so it's kind of cutting edge to publish these studies of how tanning works. But people have different base tans because of their latitude. And that has to do with in the summertime being tan enough so that you can prevent your vitamin Bs from burning out of your blood, which causes a wide variety of illnesses. Um, people who get lots of sunburns get sick for that reason, vitamin B deficiency. Similarly, in the winter, you have to pale if you're at a higher latitude um, so that you can make vitamin D. You have to make that year round. It's necessary for digesting calcium. In both cases, those nutrient deficiencies will cause the death of a pregnant woman's child. So it's a really strong selection force to have the right base tan for your latitude. And that's why you find people the same base tan in Australia, Sri Lanka, Central Africa, and in the very highlands of Central of South America, pardon me, where there's the most sunshine because it kind of varies amount of tree cover and forest cover is also related to like currents and such. It's not all just the latitude but it's mostly the latitude. So there, now you know, there's no such thing as races. There are definitely skin tans and it's not organized by continent or any other thing other than your latitude and a little bit about the weather. So um, since 2000, so 2005, I went and took my building science background and uh, became an affordable housing developer. And that's what I've been doing since 2011 is a consultancy with my team. I do, um, I mentioned I do affirmative hiring very strenuously, make sure that I've always got uh, half or more women, at least a third or more people of color, trying to get to half on that one, started a, a BIPOC um, staff collective this year to just make sure that was happening right. Okay, so first I'm gonna tell a story, <laughs> um, a little history. 
uh, from Reagan to Thunberg, Horses to Horsepower. So this is Reagan, as you, if you don't know, uh, former governor of California, former president of the United States. Um, and this is uh, Elon Musk's car, his first Tesla, which was launched into space by SpaceX and is literally in orbit around our planet right now. It's a real photo. Okay, so let's start when Reagan was born. It was 1911, it's my little, I'm gonna pick some names to make a throughput line here. Uh, there were about 27 million horses in the United States at the turn of the last century. Um, in New York City, uh, 500 a year were left on the street, dead. And this caused a lot of disease because it, um, dropsy, glanders, uh, things like typhoid, uh, these are diseases that would come from the corpses. And so there were businesses just responsible for taking horses off the street. Um, There's so much fecal pollution in the streets that people would have shovels at the corners and they would have either someone pay, pay them if they're rich, pay them to shovel the poop out of the way, or you just had to step through it. Um, it took about two acres of land to feed the horses worth of hay. And so there's massive amounts of hay coming in. So this uh, quote here, and there's lots of people talking about at the time, the horse has become unprofitable. He is too costly to keep, too, too costly to buy, too costly to keep. Also, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals started because of horse abuse in New York City. Horses mm -hmm. lived to 30 years, but they would die within three years on average in New York City. And people would beat them to death. And that, there's that phrase of you can't beat a dead horse comes from. So there is a need for a technology transition. And this is an analogy for today. This isn't just trying to help you see what we're trying to do as in the past and in the future and a little story about it. So this is the first electric car that was a commercial one, the electro bat. Um, this is, the transition went from steam to electric cars to gas cars. Uh, this electric car at the time could go faster than any electric car, any gas car. They had races with it. It was the foundation of the first electric, or the first vehicle cab business in New York City. They, would, they had an ice rink, and that's where you come in and exchange your batteries in your cab, and there's 600 and driving around. And this is the fastest car in 1899, this electric, Les jamais content, the never satisfied. It's the first car to ever get to 60 miles per hour of any type. So people liked electric cars. It's just that the storage issue was and is the main challenge because gasoline over geologic time becomes so compressed in its energy density that it's hard to replicate in the course of 100 years what has literally happened in 100 million years. But we're getting there. Um, there are electric airplanes now, for instance. So starting around 1911, you see the automobile just take off like a rocket. Here's the radio. Rural electrification happened in 1934 and you see refrigeration go up, 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 up. So the rural electrification begins electrification movement as a government sponsored thing in 34. And you can see other devices here. This is what we're trying to look for generally in electrification. But here you'll see things like electric refrigerators as opposed to storing ice or um, closed dryers in which they would try to burn gas. But now 88% um, of, of laundry dryers are electric now. So I understand like we have, since 1950, the majority of houses have had electric, have electric space heating. Since 1970, the majority have had electric water heating. And we have 62% are all stoves sold are electric and 88% of all dryers. We live in the worst state in the United States for electrification. We live in a, you know, like the main petro state, the original petro state. So 99% of new construction in California is built with gas. And my projects have been the, the 1%, um, like most of the 1%, no less, because they're doing apartment complexes. So they count like a bunch, even though it's just a few buildings. But um, so back to the story. Ronald Reagan, uh, the person who could be credited with discovering Marilyn Monroe, uh, for some Hollywood stuff he was doing. Um, he sent out someone to find a good uh, actress slash uh, model. So he was well trusted as a B-rate movie uh, star and 160 electric utilities hired him in 1953. And he started one of the top 10 television shows in 1950s. Um, sort of a real success. He had all of the Brat Pack. He had Marilyn Monroe, and he had Judy Garland, and he had any star, James Dean, all of them came on to his show and they did theater. And then the in-between spots were advertisements um, where they would have a little jingle, live better electrically, boom. And there was just this sort of 
idyllic lifestyle where you'd have all of your problems taken care of by electric devices. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, there was, of course, the race baiting at the time. Uh, when you can go onto his videos, you can see him talking specifically about his servants and how they behave well because they're electric. Uh, if you don't know, Reagan was, um, it, the first thing he did when he got elected was to go to the a city that had just lynched two men. I mean, this is in the deep south, a little itty bitty town. That was his first stop as president. <sighs> okay, so here's the gold medallion. There were um, like a million homes built with this, live better electrically. Uh, 1963, Julia Childs gets picked up. Um, she had been a CIA uh, agent and she devised a, a recipe to stop the sharks from getting close to underwater mines successfully. So you can read her whole report. She was this badass cook in the 40s um, in war effort. And she converted those skills into being a sales pitch woman for the electric utilities. All of her cooking was done on electric ranges forever. And it was funded by the electric utilities. So yes, it was a French chef, but she was showing you how you could use four different burners at different temperatures on electric, a low temperature for sauces and a high temperature for frying. And she'd have them all going at the same time while she's doing fancy French cooking. She's like electric stoves, perfect for French cooking. Oh, there she is. I wanted you to see on the left-hand side, her electric range. You can see the coils there, if you don't believe me. It's true. All right, we can stay with Reagan for a moment because he has roles. Um, he, for the 10 years, 53 to 63, he would open up the nuclear power plants all over the country. He'd show up with star power, the great listener, right? That's actually how he got trained in these fantastic motivational speeches. He'd open up a nuclear power plant with a big old speech. He became like a good public speaker, not just an actor. Because he, um, he had to step down in 63 because they found out that he had, um, as the, oh, he was the head of the, the theater guild, like all the actors, he was the head of a union, ironically. And uh, he essentially stole money as a part of his divorce alimony payment to his wife at the time. So when that came out in 63, he got let go because being divorced and stealing money, kind of shady, right? So he ran for governor and he won uh, in 67. What he came to was the dirtiest air in the country this is what an electric car looked like at the time, just so you know, they're really, they never stopped. Um, 30s air in the country and California passed a Clean Air Act that preceded the federal one, which is why we're able to set higher fuel economy standards. It's because of our exemption built into the Clean Air Act that we passed before the feds. Nixon passed the second one, um, back when Republicans did, were more engaged. Um, so, Reagan's uh, a all electric mansion here, you see in the bottom right, uh, where he had all these swank parties and he had little video crews come through as he talked about his electric servants. Um, well, it all kind of came to a crashing halt. His utility bills quadrupled in 1973 with the OPEC embargo. Those were most of the oil producing countries in the world boycott the United States. And electricity rates went fourfold up. Uh, there had been the assumption that they were going to just nuclearize everything. That was the big dream of the 50s and 60s, but it, it really stopped working out very well um, from the 70s, especially because the law that he passed in California, which is called Title 24, and it's the law that's been used to justify the all electric and solar powered codes that were passing. Reagan passed that, granted under protest, um, but the oil embargo happened literally right at the moment where he had already said, no, I'm not going to pass it. I'm just going to let it sit on my desk till it disappears. To oh, I'm going to sign it now because um, he wanted it to make it easier to do nuclear power plants. And when he left the governorship, though, the exact opposite happened. The law was used to justify it being too expensive to develop nuclear power plants. Uh, Title 24 is all about cost effectiveness. But the all-electric movement didn't stop. It picked itself back up in the 80s took about a 10 year hiatus. And this is what you're seeing across the country right now where counties are, the majority of their fuel is now electricity for space heating and domestic hot water. It's not partisan. You know, this is, you know, we might be partisan in the way we vote. And, you know, I'm not always a Democrat in the way that I vote. Uh, sometimes I do other, even more intense environmentally oriented politics. Um, but nonetheless, this is, I think important this is, the, this is what you're seeing is what developers are doing. 
This is what the real estate community is doing. This is the least expensive way to build and the most profitable way to build, therefore, because the housing market isn't dictated by the stove. You know, in California, there's a bunch of nonsense going around about that. And look in California. This is since 2010, this specific map I'm showing you. I could have shown you lots of other illustrations of how all electrics, but this is like the prettiest one. Almost all of California from 2010 on, even when it was being discouraged by the code heavily, um, it's been building electric for, for space heating and domestic hot water. And in California, it saves about $25,000 a house and in the range of $3,000 per apartment. It's almost all about the gas infrastructure, the pipes that come to the building, which you pay for in the development, the pipes, the plumbing pipes and the walls. That's most of the cost. And you see it a lot in the South because of the mountainous terrain, which is hard to get natural gas through and the wet terrain because it, you can't put gas underwater. It can, because the gas pipes leak, if they build up a, a, a big balloon of methane underneath the ground, underneath the water table, when it comes out, kaboom. So you have to not put natural gas in you know, really watery soil. I'm gonna pause. Are there any questions, any comments? Okay, keep on rolling there. So we can continue on. Schwarzenegger, Mr. Universe. Um, we had a, a problem, some of you guys will remember in 2001, some of you may not. Um, I was like 23 or something and uh, 25. Enron, Duke, Reliant and some other companies started gaming the gas system. Um, our previous Republican governor, Pete Wilson had deregulated the electric utilities meaning that anyone could come into California and start selling electricity, even if they didn't have power plants here. And the gas that's delivered to electric power plants was where the scam happened, uh, where they started gaming the delivery of gas to keep prices insanely high. You could think of how GameStop just happened a couple of weeks ago, where if you know how to game a system, which is done by you know, Goldman Sachs, they get busted every couple of years um, for gaming the stock market and illegally driving prices high, which often costs us, that the money comes from us, the consumers. Um, so that gaming of the system crashed our electric utility to stop delivering gas. We, none of us could even afford it. It was like 3,000% more expensive. Now, we didn't find out about that game until 2006. You might remember that Enron's CEO uh, died of a heart attack. The Skillings, the CFO, committed suicide. Arthur Anderson, the um, insurance agents who had, or the accountants who'd stamped it, the books as valid, when in fact they're completely fraudulent, they went bankrupt immediately, they were derated. So huge consequences. We developed our code in 2003 to favor gas, thinking that it was the electric utilities that were challenged. No, it was the gas problem, the deregulation of gas. And up till 2016, our energy code has favored gas heavily to the point in 2016, it actually essentially banned all electric construction from just a straightforward way of doing it. it had to do special calculations and do a double backflip. They, everything they made hard, what the efficiencies were, they derated them, what you were allowed to say. It just, that's more technical than you want, but it was bad until 2017 in the summer. Okay, 2006 though, Arnold's here, he's the governor. We had a recall, that's where that story happened. Recall Gray Davis because of the scandal of Enron, he got, he got blamed. We got a Republican governor, <laughs> and um, but he is an environmentalist, and that's uh, once again a place where we can agree that like the air is real. Um, and Global Warming Solutions Act then sets in motion the code we have now that has solar as a requirement. Um, it has the code we have now that's starting to favor electrification because it decarbonizes. You can get more efficiency out of the the same amount of energy if it's a heat pump than if you're burning the best gas device in the house. Not true for the electric resistance. Toaster elements are not efficient. Heat pumps are. So interesting, exciting times. Ever since then, 2006, we've been putting solar and moving towards electrification slowly. 2008, the first Tesla comes out. Um, that's done by Palm Springs there. Neil Young, he an early advocate of electrification. He electrified his 1959 Lincoln Continental Convertible. Should you like to take a ride with Neil Young? I like music, so. I want to show that off. But uh, any of the stars, um, that isn't 
Is this Tom Brady up here, by the way? People who play attention to football more than I do? This guy? <laughs> I love it. None of us know. <laughs> okay, well, um, that's a football star who built a fantastic house covered in solar power. You know, most of the actors who played the Hulk ever since I watched it as a kid with this guy, Lou Ferrigno, Mr. Universe at the time. You have all these guys put solar on the roofs, big green giants. Um, but Adele out in London, you know, the lady who made Clueless famous. Um, here we have Katy Perry, Wolverine, Thor, Black Widow, all these people. Actually, Black Widow's twin brother, she's re he's really into solar. He has a whole um, foundation for solarizing other countries. Similarly, uh, Don Cheadle spent a lot of work uh, bringing solar to um, Africa. And, you know, he did the Hotel Rwanda, has ties. Um, so Brad Pitt's got solar, uh, you know, J-Lo, she just performed at, you know, at the inauguration, you saw her, nice solar ray in her house. The guy who actually moderated the whole inauguration, right, Mr. America, um, Mr. Bosom Buddies. I liked him better when he had gigantic uh, drag outfit. He was fun. <laughs> He's done it all. Um, one of our new billionaires, right? This is an influencer, um, the Kardashian, the youngest one, you know, just, just working the YouTube. Okay, um, now this is sort of the end of this part of the story. This is Greta Thunberg on the right, and here's a modern day Schwarzenegger with his electric Humvee. And GM is coming out with the electric Hummer. This is the military one, um, the, the conventional Hummer this summer. GM has just announced this week that um, they're gonna bring out 35 versions of electric vehicles in the next five years, and they're gonna phase out all gas engines by 2035, which is rocking the world like every day in the New York Times. The new car, car companies are coming out announcing that they're going to go all electric their vehicles. So we're quickly seeing the end. When I showed you that slide, I'm going to just bring it back home. This is what electric cars are doing right now. We're having one of these huge spurts where everyone all of a sudden is agreeing this is the way to go as an international community, be it China's battery development, electric vehicles, or Volvo saying no more gas cars in 2025. Volvo, you know, huge company. This, we are going to see over the next 15 years, radical change because it's been radical for a few years and it's going faster and faster. Um, that's how, when everyone comes to a consensus, that's how it works. So Greta Thunberg, um, you see, uh, she's a really interesting, amazing human being. If you're not familiar with her, which I'm sure you are. Um, you know, she came out recently with an um, announcement that she was on the Asperger's uh, spectrum, like, like my business partner, Michael Winkler, who's former mayor of Arcata, who stepped down. And, you know, some real power comes out of this particular um, personality type. So you might have seen her give a serious slant eye to Trump one time that got made it onto the comedies. Look at her face just for a moment. That's a Greta Thunberg you don't usually see when she's chewing out the United Nations or going to the European Union and, and shaming them as they well deserve. This is like she's letting a person touch her, step one, right? And, and, and what he did is he, he gave her electric Humvee to drive all over the place in. And he was part of the team that got her around the United States um, with his electric vehicle. So uh, this is this, the story of what's kind of been happening. We're gonna transition now for a moment in case you have, also any other questions or comments? Nick, you got anything for me in the chat? Uh, looks like Steve would like a uh, clarification on GM by 2035, or has a clarification on it. Yeah, please. G Steve, you want to add? Uh, well, you can read it in the papers. Um, General Motors. Yeah, no, 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 no. I realize that. No, but just there's just stuff in the paper in the last day about this. Yeah. The, the GM is not. I, I mean, you know, and, and the thing about this is, is that really, given the adoption curve for EVs, the 2035 thing was a joke anyway, because it's going to happen before that. Just so. But yeah, I mean, it, I, I see 13, 10 to 15 years is how fast adoption curves move, just historically, all those different appliances. So I think it's unlikely that we're going to pull off anything faster than that naturally. But if we do heavy duty government support, it could really go much faster. As an example, the city of Sacramento, um, you know, they're going to, they're saying they're going to do, you know, all electric construction by 2023. I've talked with the utility engineers. Like I know 
them fairly high up in the organization and they could electrify everything now and the entire grid would be just fine. The only thing would happen is be a depreciation. So their, their transformers would die about 10 years earlier. They may be waited for 30 years. They might only last 20 years. Yeah, I was just talking EVs to be clear. Yeah. But I'm talking buildings too, and electrical and electric vehicles. Like it's, you know, one of the questions is, can we? A lot of people have technical doubts. Can we electrify as fast as we need to? And I'm just saying yes, on a technical level, yes. And I agree with you 100%. It's going to go faster than 2035. It's, it's yeah. And one of the things that's driving that um, is the Berkeley gas ban. So you guys are probably familiar, 2019, August 6th, love that date. Um, they banned gas piping to units. It was done on the basis of safety, climate change, and energy efficiency. And I'm gonna go into the safety part of this talk next. Um, here's just some examples of apartment complexes that are all electric that have been supporting um, down the Bay Area, and there's a bunch, but these are pretty ones. Um, so I'm gonna toot my own horn for just a second. I've been trying to get all electric construction in California since 2011, when I realized it saved money and helped with affordable housing developments so I was working on get the budgets done. So this has been something I've been frustrated about though for years. I would go to the planning commission, uh, sorry, the um, energy commission, big meetings or conferences. So there'd be like 600 people in the room. I'd go up to the microphone and ask, so commissioner McAllister, can you tell me when you're going to be banning gas? Like we can see in you know, AB 32, global warming solution. Like when is that gonna happen? And that is literally a laugh line in 2016 like a huge uproarious ha 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 from everybody. And he would sort of be coy and he's like, well, I really can't say. The answer is 2025. That's what's happened as a consequence of these bans. And what I did out of frustration was get the legal opinion written for Berkeley. I stopped waiting for someone else to do it. I just hired a lawyer, used the company that I have here and put $15,000 on the table. And that got the legal opinion that allowed Berkeley to move forward because no one had asked the question and answered of how can we legally do this? And it turns out there's three ways that we're seeing in the various electrification ordinances that are going around. There's indoor air quality, safety, and, um, <laughs> and oh, what am I saying? Indoor air quality, safety, and energy. Yeah, energy efficiency. I will, okay. So here's an example. This is a nice little map. This is a snapshot of right now but Sacramento is not yet, even though they're doing it. Uh, Los Angeles is, the mayor's announced that he wants it to happen this year. They're all electric um, ordinance, no methane in construction. So there's, there's 42 jurisdictions right now, 40 cities, two counties. It's kind of a big deal. It's Seattle just passed theirs two days ago where they're banning natural gas and new construction of, of mid-rise buildings and commercial construction. So this is, um, it's going national quickly. Um, Salt Lake City, New York City. New York City just announced that they're gonna electrify 600,000 houses in the next 10 years. All the affordable housing in New York City is gonna get electrified in the next decade. If anyone wants a job in New York City, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done in electrifying. Um, so this is- John, do you, have, do you know how many people that uh, map affects? Yeah, it's a, oh God, it's like one in four, I think. You know, it's mostly the Bay Area. Um, and when Los Angeles comes around and does it, you know, Santa Monica already did. And like, this is, we can capture in the range of 70% of the cities that have politics that support this, 70% of the people in California. By, with the cities that seem to be politically supporting it. San Diego's moving forward on it. Los Angeles is a number of the cities around, the smaller cities around LA, like Custer, um, are moving on this. They're, they're like their city councils have been talking about it. So uh, even though we can't get the state to do it uh, until 2025, we can get a lot of work done before 2025. And we need to, because it's, it's expensive on society and it's incredibly destructive for all of our health. There's an equal amount of gas coming out of buildings right now is out of light duty cars. All the cars in California are equal to all the buildings. And we've been focusing a lot on cars justifiably, but we need to work on buildings too. Okay, so Berkeley, they, they're like, hey, you know, this is a big deal that natural gas, methane, I should say, in buildings. Um, 
is so destructive. You can have a gas leak and you can blow up the entire building. And I can show you a whole slide deck that I have of explosions. And they happen about six out of seven days in the United States. It's a really significant thing. It happens when people are building and they're forgot the contractors die. It happens to the neighbors who are completely unaware that there was an issue next door, kaboom, you know, take out a whole apartment complex. Um, it's dangerous, it's flammable gas. Uh, we really saw this heavily in 1989 um, when during the World Series earthquake, Loma Prieta, uh, there was a gas line that blew up in the Marina District and only the people there were able to save it from becoming a 1906 level fire because the first water supply system broke, the second water supply system broke in the earthquake, both of them were cracked. And it was only the tertiary one that only installed a couple years earlier aware of the fact that can't be too prepared for earthquakes in San Francisco. Um, and it was the first responders were all the neighbors who were there to prevent it from becoming an incredibly destructive fire. So after the 1994 earthquake, Northridge, which half of the buildings that burnt down were from broken gas lines, the state was like, what's going on here? They could have put out a report in 2001 and discovered that in fact, since, two, since 1906, at least half the fires were from broken gas lines. In 1906, all the lighting was gas. So just pipes all throughout people's buildings um, that broke and then blew up. In 2010, um, you know, like in an irony, it's almost unbelievable to the staff at the Public Utilities Commission who are in charge of gas safety were blown up when natural gas uh, was ruptured in this deep line that wasn't marked. And just so you know, pg &E falsified from 2011 after this through 2017 for safety inspections. The whole time they're collecting money and not doing the work. And it was, it's incredibly dangerous. Tons of people have had their homes blown up in that period of time, including a sort of famous one in Carmel by the sea because you know, the rich mayor really threw a fit about the fact that the gas pipelines weren't marked and multiple people lost their homes. Those are expensive homes, you know? So uh, eight people died, 38 homes destroyed. 2015, you're, almost all of you must remember the Aliso Canyon leak, how poisoned the community became, people blowing up, you know, like their noses running with blood and vomiting and the heavy metal poisoning that will be permanent and damage their nervous system. So there, that community, by the way, in Aliso Canyon is heavily in favor of electrification. They don't want that canyon to ever get filled back up with gas. The things like dates from the 1940s. Um, and you can't really get inside of a mountain and fix it. It's not how things work. So, and then this fire, um, my mother-in-law died in this fire in Santa Rosa. And like always, I'll, and I'm getting a little teary. But, no. Um, so I, I have the encouragement of the family to continue to tell this story. The um, fire that you see here, this is natural gas pipelines that are still burning. The day that she was supposed to go get her afflicted lungs checked out because she had cancer as a teenager and x-rays had damaged her lungs. So she had lung pre-existing conditions. The day she's supposed to go and get checked in, the hospital is evacuated instead because this is um, a low income trailer home park that was um, burnt to the ground. And so they had to evacuate the hospital. She wasn't able to get her medical appointment and she died of smoke inhalation that week. It was so smoky there that um, coughing actually ended just rupturing her lungs and she sort of bled to death internally. So I've, I've always thought it was important for people to see that the gas infrastructure was an accelerant to the fire as well as a contributor to a huge amount of smoke, as well as you know, the cause of the climate change, because methane leaks specifically are a magnifying lens that take place over about 11 years that methane exists in the atmosphere. You might have waited over 100 years like the IPCC does, the United Nations and such, or you might do it over 20 years, like it's becoming a better practice to try to capture really intense, short-lived uh, climate change agents. So, you, you, if you stop burning gas and using gas, about half the climate change impact of gas is the leaked gas. It's only 3% of the system is leaked, but that is equal to all of the combustion. The 97% that's burned is equal to the climate change impact of the 3% that is leaked. That's how that math works. It, 
it's pretty bad. And the only way to stop it is to stop the actual delivery of gas to your house. Called it, it's, um, it's a little plunger. It's, it's a pressure regulator, pressure regulator valve. So to make sure the pressure doesn't get too high and then it on purpose leaks. So then there's the issue of what it does to the people inside the house. As a home cook, I didn't realize, I just had no idea. Um, but I'm gonna start off with the premature birth of my twins. My wife and I would use the oven, the gas oven to warm our little studio apartment because we have access to our own heating system. It was controlled by upstairs and the landlord was frugal. So we got to be cold downstairs. So we'd run the oven, not realizing that the nitrogen dioxide that we were releasing causes premature births. And we had a significantly premature birth with our twins, which was a, a medical emergency and changed our lives forever. And the twins are fantastic, there's no issues, but it was bad. And then when you have kids, the number one source of formaldehyde in your house is your gas stove. Formaldehyde is a combustion byproduct that's heavier than air. And so it puddles around your feet. And if you ever wondered why pets get leukemia, like why does my cat get leukemia? That's what formaldehyde causes. If you've ever seen a dead animal floating for 200 years in a vial of formaldehyde, you understand how dangerous it is. It kills everything. No bacteria, nothing can live in formaldehyde. That's the chlorine bonds in it. It's incredibly toxic. And that's your number one source of formaldehyde in your life is your gas stove. And it's heavier than air and it kills pets and it gives kids leukemia, as well as asthma as well as you know, doubling the amount of heart attack medication you might have to take if you're the home cook, the, you know, tripling the amount of wheeze that you have. If you have wheeze, if you're on a gas stove, you're gonna have three times as much wheeze. You have to take two times as much heart attack medication if you're the home cook. People don't understand. They're huffing. It's like putting the muffler of your car inside your house, which everyone knows you know, that will kill you. Yeah, this will kill you. <laughs> um, it's, if you have... Um, this is what it looks like in the worst, dirtiest outside air in the United States on the right-hand side. This is the legal limit. There's no place outside in the United States right now that is beyond the legal limit for air pollution. You can't find it. Every single county is in compliance because of our Clean Air Act. This is what happens when you cook one dish on a gas stove. This is if you cook a whole meal. This is if you're doing your oven cleaning. But this is dangerous. I learned about this in 2011. Okay, uh, Brett Singer published an article in 2011. I've been corresponding. He's a doctorate over at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I asked him in this interview we did, published it up. I said, hey, a New Yorker article in April 2019 about the hidden air pollution in our homes said kitchen air during cooking was so dirty that there's actual smog formation that 20 to 30 minutes of cooking on, 20 to 30 minutes of cooking on a gas stove after 20 to 30 minutes of cooking on a gas stove. Was that an exaggeration? It's like, no. If you add pollutants to nitrogen dioxide from gas stoves to the cooking emissions, like you know the oil and moisture, uh, it is a mixture of pollutants deserving of a name like smog, although that name is already taken by outdoor air pollution. Fine, just call it kitchen smog. It, it's the same stuff, it's the same chemicals, it's the same reactions. You have actual smog in your kitchen just from cooking your meal. So uh, up here, this is the nitrogen dioxide rates. You know, what happens, this is from that LBNL study, um, 2014 and this one. Here is carbon monoxide. So people are getting poisoned at um, dangerous levels, particularly in the winter time. When people close their homes, that's the white is the winter, blue is the summer. And here's formaldehyde, significantly dangerous all the time. think your kid has that and actually they're about to die. Um, you know, four-year-old daughter dies with leukemia just 11 days after a diagnosis. You know, teenager dies one week after being diagnosed and having shown no symptoms. It, this is formaldehyde poisoning. And, you know, on a justice issue, you know that people in lower-income homes 
which I do affordable housing, they, the house itself is smaller, which concentrates the same amount of cooking pollution. So after years of me advocating on this, this year, the energy commission's changing the code for 2022. Can't be too soon, can we? Um, 2023 is when it starts. So that small apartments have to have higher ventilation rates from their hood and bigger homes don't because bigger homes, the pollution spreads, but in apartments, it gets extra concentrated and it's extra poisonous. And so we have like, that's a, an improvement in code that doesn't take place now. And they still haven't required that hoods actually turn on when people are cooking. And only 15 to 30% of the time do people think to turn on their hood. And usually they're so noisy. Um, and if you, they're not even code compliant on noise. People aren't enforcing the code around noise. They're so noisy people don't want to use them because it hurts. There's some real work to be done. And the first thing is get rid of your gas stove if you can. All the famous chefs support you in this. These are all advocates of all electric cooking you're seeing here. Um, this is a fantastic bakery down in Ventura. I mean, I think literally the best bakery I've ever been to. Um, but you know, this is the French laundry owner. Angus Fat of Fat Mile Restaurants. Want to make sure you know that you know, any kind of cooking works on electric ranges, walks work on induction, etc. Um, this is a really fancy restaurant in Chicago. Um, I'm from the, the area of Wisconsin, close to Chicago. Alinea. It's got three Michelin stars. This is an all-electric kitchen. About two-thirds of the three-starred restaurants in our country and the world, including in France, um, are all electric because they have better control. They can set the exact temperature they want. You know, the French Laundry does sous vide, which is setting, a, it's like a bag of meat that's set at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't do that at a gas stove. It burns at 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not that controllable. Where electric is extremely controllable. So you can make these, which are helium marshmallow balloons. So Justin Timberlake over here, if you thought his voice was high before, after he pops this and inhales it on Instagram, I think it is, you can watch a little video of it. It's really funny. <laughs> it's a very high voice. Um, that's one of the things they're famous for, pulling out of their all-electric kitchen. I want to make sure you can see that this works terrific for barbecue. Uh, Florida has got a lot of all-electric restaurants because of the high water table I mentioned at the beginning. So this is all-electric barbecue going on. And, and to be clear, this is a tradition. This isn't like some crazy new thing. There hasn't been gas. This is how people have been doing barbecue in lots of the South forever. Here's the LA airport. Um, they tried to make that the newest terminal from 2012, I think it was all electric, but two restaurants objected. So they put gas infrastructure at cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars through the building to get to the two restaurants. But most of them, yeah, are like, yeah, all electric, no problem. We do that everywhere in the country. We have a gas kitchen for some places, an electric kitchen for some place, whatever. You know, uh, if we move into a building with gas, obviously we'll be using the gas because it's all there, um, that kind of thing. So. I want to show you then if I'm convincing you to get rid of your gas stove. This is my cheapo solution. This is one of my electric test ovens. I've got one down here. My little tiny office is filled with test stuff. And um, the, the brands that I like right now are True Induction and Eurodib. Uh, Eurodib is a little bit noisier, but it, it ends up cooking food faster because of the power. These are all plug-in devices. So for 100 to say $300, you can get a 120 volt plug-in two burner oven, or sorry, range, pardon me. You can get two of them if you want, right? Have four. My wife and I, she cooks over there. I cook over here. I'm kind of elbowy. I'm a very big person and I like to cook a lot. And um, she likes to do like caramels and she milks the cow every morning. So she likes to do some cool stuff with dairy and she wants the exact temperature controls. So she's got like a fancier commercial version and I get this sort of cheapo two burner. And, um, and then we have an electric oven, you know, and, and we harvest turkeys every year. We bake them in the oven, you know, um, we are uber sustainable. So like a couple days ago, a lamb was born and it died right away. She can rescue it. She's out there in the rain trying her best. Um, so we baked it and it's the cat food I feed our cat every day. And that's how all of my like, my, I don't want to have a, a predator animal in my life until we can actually support it off the waste meat from the farm. Um, we're about 30 acres, and so it's, that's the deal. And he eats a lot of lung because <laughs> no one wants it. Um, but heart is delicious. Okay, so 
if you are building a, an affordable housing apartment complex, you're almost certainly getting one of these models. It's electric resistance radiant. So it's a glass new top, super easy to clean, way easier than gas. It's always burnt in there, right? So these are easy to clean and they're 500 bucks. These are the fancier ones. Um, these are induction ranges. They're twice as much and you can go up and up. Um, just like with electric ranges, you can go to $4,000 in electric resistance um, and just like with induction, but it starts at about a thousand bucks um, for a fridge air. You have to plug them into a 240 volt outlet. So that means you need to have that power there. I wanna point you back at this for a moment. These plug into any of the existing outlets, no issues. Just plug it in, you can start cooking, which is what I did. I had a gorgeous old antique. We dragged it out of a field, damaged the van getting it in, a chamber from the 50s. I was so proud of my gas range. It was one of the early insulated models, like, oh, it's energy efficient, it's old, I'm recycling, it's awesome, it's beautiful. Have a party, show off your oven range, right? It's the hearth of the kitchen. Not realizing it's poisoning me. Um, so I put, I plugged this Eurodib in right next door to it and just, and it started cooking. And I was like, oh my God, this is so much easier. So much faster. It's so much, what am I doing with this thing? I don't even want to use it anymore. So it's like slower and harder to use. Uh, it's dirtier too. Um, and dirtier to clean as well. I was always having problems with pilots. So this is the cheap, easy way to retrofit your kitchen. It's perfect for any rental, no issues. If you Sean, there's a question in the chat. Please. What is Does it? the countertop of the, the countertop, um, Helena, um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. If it's this one, does it need magnetic bottom pans? All my baking pans are Pyrex. Yes. Or you have to put a piece of metal. They make little trivets that you put underneath it so that it's like uh, essentially the heat. Um, the magnets that are in there, they're actually coils of copper and they, you pulse electricity through it and it makes uh, photons, you know, but they're really big, they're radio wave photons. So they go through everything the way radio waves just go through stuff. So they don't touch you. They don't have any interaction with your atoms. And so you, it, you put the pan on there and it needs to have a piece of metal that is ferrous that will accept um, the, essentially the magnetic energy. Magnetic energy is a type of photon in essence. Uh, these are, it's called the electromagnetic uh, frequency, right? So these are all one and like um, Arnold, uh, like Einstein thinking, it like light and energy are one. Anyway, so yeah, you're gonna need to have a piece of metal above it and it's either a pot or pan with a built into it or it can be a piece of metal underneath it that will, that will heat up and then it'll heat up your thing. And that's more like electric resistance. Um, and in fact, just to be clear, it's all electric resistance. When the photons hit the electrons, they're trying to push the electrons through the metal in electric resistance, but ferrous metal doesn't let it go through. So it heats up instead. It dumps all of its energy as heat. I could go on at length on this if anyone wants to know the physics of induction. <laughs> But uh, fundamentally, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a radio wave, like wave, very low energy wave, huge wave that you put a pot or pan on that has metal in it that can deal with magnets. That's how you can tell the magnet sticks to it. And it, it's fundamentally, it's just the reverse of how we make electricity, by the way. Like a, a hydroelectric dam spins a magnet inside of copper coils, and that makes the electricity moves from the copper. And in this case, you have a copper coil you're putting electricity into, and it's making a magnetic wave, um, and that is pushing, trying to push electrons through the metal up there, but not. It's just heating it up. So you, you get a, like a really fast acting, very efficient. This is about twenty percent more efficient than electric resistance. A very effective way to transmit heat directly into a pan. That's why it's so, just like gas, it's immediate. Like you turn it off, boom, no more heat, um, as opposed to coils which stay hot. Hope that wasn't too much of an answer. <laughs> Um, so these things, you need a new power supply. You know, you need like a 240 volt line, like a dryer electricity or a car charger electricity. And that's um, a 400 to $4,000 wiring job, depending upon the size of your house. It can be just cheap, you know, just get a wire over from your panel. But if you have a big house or you're in the Bay Area and prices are insane for labor and such, um, it, like, there shouldn't be more than $1,000 to deliver an electric line. But that's how it should be. And then I just wanted to um, close on this one. 
Uh, Japan has been the intellectual leader on electrification for a long time. They only have coal there and they've also got nuclear power, but no oil reserves, no gas, and um, very little of it. So the earliest awesome heat pumps for space heating and cooling were out of Japan. It was invented in America, but the really good ones came out of Japan in 2001. Um, the ones that have computers to control the process so it can go negative 30 Fahrenheit instead of getting stuck at like 40 Fahrenheit, 35 Fahrenheit. Um, these little computers are called inverters, but they're just a computer and they just run the system faster in, in a way that's responsive to the outside temperature and inside temperature desired. So these are examples of kick-ass induction ranges. This is how they do it. Um, you have a two to three burner and then you have a drawer oven below. They don't have a turkey tradition like we do. This is pretty much the only thing that needs space in an oven is the height of the turkey. Everything else is just sheets, right? So they have these uh, pull-out ovens. And um, I, my brother is an international artist, he and his spouse. And so when they were in Japan, I like, sent them on an errand run for me. Like, Go to a Home Depot-like store and take a bunch of photos. I wanna see what they're doing. And it's awesome. Um, all these induction ranges, uh, the, like heat pumps everywhere, all over the walls. Everything's all about the heat pumps. Um, condensing washer dryers. If anyone's interested in how to electrify your own home, uh, one of the things I point out is get rid of your electric resistance dryer and get a, a combination washer dryer, which uses one seventh of the electrical power, uses about one half of the energy over a year, uh, but also just has very little power need. It's, so you can just plug it into any outlet in your house. And people who are renters can retrofit their apartments really easily just by plugging it into their house and running the condensate down the sink. You don't have to run a vent out because it, it condenses the water out of your laundry. And it's just like a, it's a tank of water that has to flow into a sink as opposed to venting it out because uh, essentially what's happening is that you're boiling your laundry at 212 and, and steam is coming off of it. And you just keep on sucking that steam out. You can either blow it outside or you can condense it, but it's water that comes out. So it's, it's an easy retrofit, condensing washer dryers. Um, okay, that I had promised to give you as like an electrification talk and to focus on cooking. And I did that, but I'm more than happy to do other things if you have questions. Uh, Sean, there are two in the chat and I'd invite Deborah um, to come off mute. But at first I wanna say thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna about to get bombarded with chats. So. To um, to just give a quick round of applause. Thank you all.